Yo, you, you, you are in a place with some very cool lighting, my friend. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm just chilling in my room. Well, your room has very cool lighting, so that's cool. I appreciate it. <laughs> how are you uh, doing? So, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm just waking up, just getting ready to move, you know, living life. That's as one will do until they're dead. Um, so um, first off, people at home are, are listening or on their phones or, or watching on their, hopefully on a really nice 4K TV. Like I really hope that this is what they're watching on a nice 4K. Who are you? For those, uh, for those who have no idea who, who you are, please explain. All right. uh, hi, uh, I am St. Dion. My government name is Amari Hunter. Uh, <laughs> I am a rapper, producer, singer, writer, actor, you know, I'm just a big fanatic of the arts. So, you know, uh, uh, I think the last, the last project that a lot of people heard in the city was uh, No More, uh, Nobody in Heaven. And I think that's kind of how everybody figured me out. So, so. So that was how, um... I heard about your music. It was um, Nobody in Heaven. And so it was something that, that, that I listened to. And there was an, it, it made me sad that the stereo in my car is a piece of crap, but it made me, it made me grateful that the one in my wife's car is much nicer. So that when my <laughs> car inevitably took the gigantic poop that it did, I was able to then drive my wife's car with a much better sound system. Uh, and there are songs on the album, um, on the album that I've kind of been waiting to talk to you about. Uh, and so I'm grateful to, to take the time. And I'm grateful to do it when you have more music uh, coming out. When you have new stuff coming out, I'm grateful to talk to you about that as well, because you can, you can talk about both. Um, but songs like Media, um, coming, out, coming out around the time that it did, which um, the record came out in uh, April, if I'm not mistaken. Has it been that long? Mm -hmm. Uh, nobody, uh, nobody in heaven. I think came out uh, July first okay. week of July. All right, I was way off then. I don't know what I was looking. For. <laughs> um, okay, so it came out in July. Really contentious time. I mean, uh, when were you recording the record? So a lot of the record actually. So nobody in heaven. I began the concept of it in I think 2019 about September-ish that's when I wrote the original version of Pride because Pride was about like me and my dad falling out and I wrote that right after uh, graduation so that's the, when I had the whole idea for Pride and then a lot of the movements a lot of the injustices in of course America and that's when I finally would just I was like I need to take that energy and use my voice and put something together that really represents who I am as an artist and you know what my position is and that all of this you know mayhem. Um, so. Do you think that it was important for you as an artist to uh, to make your voice heard uh, not just on on relations or not just on matters of like say social justice but also on uh, relationships with uh, yeah. your father, with the people that are in your life. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure as an artist, it's important to share these things, but um, but reflecting on specific things, does it make it a little bit harder? Right. It, I mean, it. I guess reflecting on like very specific things in it, the main overall message was mentality as well, because it's like, realistically the only person you know is you you don't know anybody else you can try and put yourself into somebody else's perspective but you'll never 100 percent know that perspective that's why it's called nobody in heaven because real like in this mindset there's nobody above you and there's nobody below you so there's nobody above you and the only thing above you really would be heaven or the sky and the athos you know so it's just that's why like i put it like that because it's about mentality and being more like you know more courageous in oneself rather than having to be a part of like this herd mentality you know so so um with a song like media what were can you talk about some of the influences on that one yeah so a lot of the influences were especially you know when there was a lot of the black lives matter uh protests and then blue lives matter and then a lot of these you know subsidies of black lives matter 
I guess that's not really a, I would say alt groups of Black Lives Matter uh, came about and then in media like CNN, Fox, Breitbart, all these different, you know, news outlets, there will be the same story, but it'll be split from 15 different perspectives. And it's kind of like, that's why I split the song in three ways how I did, because I was telling the same story in each song. But like from the perspective of like if I was CNN and I was, you know, extremely, extremely left, or if I was Fox and I was extremely right, you know, um, or if I was like Breitbart and just extremist. So it's like, that's where the very last part of it, that's why it's so gruesome and so like dark because I'm trying to represent the pure darkness and misinformation in what is media. It's, it's a really heavy concept and it's one that we've really had play out in front of our faces over the last um, year plus. One of, one of the things that I've seen in the media and, and this really crazy overreaching is, is you, you talk about, uh, about different movements, whether it's Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, uh, whatever the group is. It's, all, it's always the dudes that like stay too late. Like it's always the folks that always, it's never the folks that like that, that go to a demonstration and then go home. Like it's always the guys that didn't make plans for dinner afterwards. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know. There was a joke in there about like, you wouldn't have stormed the, uh, the white or you wouldn't have stormed Congress if you had made plans for lunch afterwards. The joke just oh, didn't no. work. It just didn't work. It sucked. Sorry, man. I was, it was a joke that, that I thought had a place and then just ruined, just, you know what, make dinner plans and hang out with people afterwards. Consume. Um, but uh, I don't know. Fuck it. Um, I understand what you're saying about the media because the, it, it seems like the media, well, the, I, I worked in, uh, I worked in commercial radio for a little while. Right. And my experience with that is that it's, um, your, your hour clock of a, uh, a news commentator is one hour that is broken down in 12 minute segments, right? And between those segments are commercials. And the job of the commentator is just to get a person to react and everything about it from the production of, um, of the video and how it's edited and chopped together is to get you angry enough to stick around through the commercials so that you maybe you find out what the resolution is after the commercial break. And in the first right. commercial break, they'll sell you like uh, a Ford and then they'll sell you uh, a shitty chain restaurant. And then they'll send you like a heart medication. Now you'll need the heart medication because you ate at the shitty restaurant. Uh, you're eating at the shitty restaurant and you're driving there in the Ford that you know, you're paying for for the next eight years. The next commercial, like after the, like the next segment when they're getting you even more jacked up and psyched up about whatever it is that you're supposed to be angry about, whether it's MSN, whether it's, uh, I feel bad for all of these human beings because their job is to be angry all the time. Like that's, that's your occupation is one hour a day. You've got to be pissed off about the universe. All right. And you've got to do it. And, and that's your whole persona because all these folks have radio shows too. So they've got to be angry on there and then they've got to be angry on TV and then they've got to be angry in their book and their entire universe is based on zero fucking joy. But that next commercial break is they sell you a slightly nicer car and then they sell you a, like a boner pill and then they sell you um, a slightly better shitty chain restaurant. Right. And then they, they move into the next hour and that cycle just repeats itself of like boner pills and heart medication. But you, you need to take the boner medication because the, the heart pill is fucking you up. The heart pill is fucking you up because you're taking an antidepressant because someone was able to convince you through manipulation on the television that you needed a right. $70,000 um, some mother lover of a son of a biscuit, right? The fat guy in the BMW, as Tim Ferriss calls it, you needed to be that guy. So instead of like going to the gym or listening to some music or creating something cool, painting your garage, whatever, um, it's it's um, it's keeping up with this fake ideal standard that is based on a, a fake concept of joy. It's uh, again, Tim Ferriss, uh, happiness over excitement. What you're actually seeking is excitement. Uh, 
happy is a vague term. So you seek excitement. And that's those are the things that, that, that keep you alive. Um, but if you're if you've got a seventy thousand dollar car payment, and they, uh, you know you've got a seventy thousand or a seven hundred thousand dollar or four hundred thousand dollar house payment, or all of these things that you don't actually own, you're essentially renting from a bank. Um, right. You know, and so you need all of these medications because you have all of these additional built-in stressors on your life. But it's how are you taking in the information that supposedly matters to you? Uh, and the other thing is, is most of the crazy shit that's happening isn't happening anywhere we live. So the people that live where we live are freaking out about something that doesn't exist to them. All right. Um, that's just, just a thought. So like from just kind of like from taking from that, like that was because like it makes sense so essentially like what i got from that was like that even like you're saying like in the media the smallest things have a long-term effect like because it applies to like the minute like the most minimal things in life because like what you're saying was like the stress relievers and then everything else how you have to pay off the lien holder from the, your car and this time the third and then in the end you're dealing with that as the aftermath of all of this yeah. that's kind of what i got from that that's i mean pretty, crazy like how influence really just works though that's why like media is such like the demon that it really is though it's, it's, it's weird i think part of it is making a point to put out good shit right right because ultimately the ult the really the ultimate currency is time right and some folks yeah. time is more valuable than others uh some folks time is going to have a, a a more worthwhile I don't know, shift and release into the universe. Some folks are just going to be consumers uh, of things until they figure out what it is that they can, what it is that they want to produce, the things that make them happy. Um, and I think it was important to talk to you because you, you make it a point to, to do your best to put out good shit. And, um, and, and I'm sharing that with you as, as probably not a guy that was, uh, I, I was probably not in mind uh, the, 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 the consumer that you were thinking about when, uh, you were writing, um, uh, when, when you were writing the album, when you were writing, um, sorry, pulling my phone, uh, nobody in heaven, yeah. but it was a very good album. Who did the, the production on it? So I actually produced, uh, nobody in heaven. Um, <clears throat> like that was something that honestly spent most of the time, most of the, uh, most of the time that I spent on the album was, more on production really than it was writing because writing was from most of the songs were just from like a lot of poetry that I had wrote, uh, written previously and concepts that I written down and I just morphed them into full songs. Um, I would say that the song that honestly took the longest on that project was probably yes I think that like that was the hardest one for me um the, the, but the the two songs that um were produced with my friends as well was uh ml tyler on north bun he helped me with the first beat and then uh huss from vitus he uh it's like my brother but he actually fully produced like the the song nobody in heaven like that was his whole idea like the whole production the arrangement everything that was like his idea and it was a it was killer so but yeah no uh that album yeah <laughs> how important was it for you to not sound like anyone else uh i mean not just coming out of anchorage i mean it's a big part of it because they're they're not a lot of i mean they're a lot but they're not a lot of musical influences in anchorage right. um so your album doesn't sound uh, like it was produced by anyone else than whoever it was produced by. Um, right. But it was, it was really good. That's why I had to ask. So then moving on to questions I normally save for like producers is uh, what software are you using? And then moving on to hardware. So the software that I use, I use FL20. Um, and then I, uh, that's the DAW that I use. And then I, was messing around with Ableton for a little bit, but that's not, it's not really, 
I can't do nothing with that. Um, Studio Studio One Five, or uh, I think it was Five that just came out. I was messing with the free trial with that, just kind of like because I know Raw Beats uses it, so I was uh, trying to, I guess, producing that for a second. But like, usually FL Studios. So, who are the producers that influenced you? Um, biggest producers over time, honestly, um, I would say Jay Dilla, Kanye, definitely Kanye. Um, I would say Bonnie Bear, and I would go honestly as back to say as like, because I grew up on like indie music and EDM, so I would say Dead Mouse, you know, Dodge and Pooski, like a lot of these like people out there, you know, because like that's especially with um, a lot of the transitioning in the building around Nobody in Heaven was I built it like in post to try and have more of an EDM transitions between things like on OBA the beginning where it had like a, the granular scent on my vocals and then like a like the theme that I was trying to do was like have it so it's like a whole fever dream all the way across and like it was easier to kind of think of like the hip-hop structure but switch it into like EDM like an EDM build. It, it worked it, it worked I think the two sounds very much go together uh, uh the, the the trap soul sound uh, I think was probably very important to that in the last five years. Uh, but that even right. echoes back to like early nineties house, just, uh, uh, moving R and B, um, and, and that, that thumping like 808 just together, um, with sort of danceable movement. I mean, in, in Vogue killed it, dude. Um, so I, I think it's important to, I mean, a, to do what works, but to do what's also different. Um, right as an artist, uh, from the perspective of, a, uh, have a hard time saying like, you know, saying, uh, you know, like describing as one thing or the other. Um, but as an artist, who are some of the artists that influenced you, uh, rather than just producers? Rather than producers, I would say Frank Ocean, um, uh, Kanye West, Tyler, the creator, like more in that kind of like, side because I really like the anti-pop and like the, how raw they are with what they say and how raw their production is like I'm not really the biggest fan of like you know like pop production or just something that's like too simple so like I really love their sound for just how raw it sounds and like I really love them as artists like their writing and everything like especially like you know like I would say older Kanye especially when he was going deeper in depth about like the things that were just like happening around him and he would explain it in such unnecessarily detail. Like, and it was just, it's crazy. And then you have Frank Ocean who with his words will pull you into a track and make you swim with him. Like that's, it's just absolutely insane. And Tyler, the creator where it's like, he has this ability to morph into different characters and songs and you wouldn't even notice like, it's just crazy. And uh, I would say Kendrick Lamar on that same like pedestal of that as well, because of just like being able to build into like different characters and everything. And that's just something that I thought like, that I think is insane. But those are my favorite artists. So if you're looking for, um, for a good source of, of that sound, I, I would recommend uh, checking out Roy Ayers. He's a, a kind of West coast jazz legend, uh, just released yeah, yeah. a record last year. Um, with um, Adrian Young and Ali Shaheed Muhammad uh, from Tribe Called Quest on their Jazz is Dead label. But Roy Ayers is a R O Y Y E R S. Oh, wow. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, and, and by all means, let me know what you think. Um, he was a heavy influence. On, on the early melodies of uh, that, that made Dre popular along with guys like uh, Erotic B and a whole bunch of other guys who's name probably like these guys' names get hit and missed in the, the history books, but for, for that that early West Coast jazz influence that you got with the melodies of someone like DJ Quick. Right. Who's a fucking genius. Um, and I think the modern equivalent of that is Flying Lotus. Um, I love Flying Lotus so much. <laughs> Kate Trinata, Flying Lotus, like everybody from Selection, like when that was like a label, that that everybody in that group was so raw. Like, uh, <laughs> man. 
I honestly uh, think like Flying Lotus is like a modern day uh, Jay Dilla. Like I would go that far. It's a weird thing. I would, I would like to hear more from Flying Lotus, but that's just because I really like Flying Lotus. Yeah. And and I I love and it, it, it breaks my heart saying this, but I love that all the time we're coming across like old beat tapes from Dilla and, and folks are finding new ways to kind of repurpose them and, and give them new life or that we're getting them. But um man, yeah. I would I would go even further back and say maybe um Without without the shooting women, almost uh, I I would compare Flying Lotus just as much to someone like Phil Spector and his Wall of Sound, uh, the way that they just kind of created uh, a univer a universe in which the songs could live in. And if you were listening with good headphones, and if you had a chance to really enjoy, that's how the music the music was meant to be blared out of everything, but the music was meant to be enjoyed with a pair of good headphones, which is I, I think the ideal way to listen to music. And when you're listening to someone like uh, like K Trotta or, um, or Sturgill Simpson, who's uh, kind of a weird alt rock country singer, like when you listen to him with headphones, you get it. Like, oh shit, like I am, I didn't get it before, now I get it. It's like listening to John Coltrane uh, under the influence of anything, up to and including melatonin, man. And sometimes you just gotta, you gotta pop three milligrams of melatonin to help yourself sleep. Um, do it with some John Coltrane and, uh, and, and enjoy the sweet, sweet dreams. Um, but there, there's just music that's supposed to be listened to uh, with headphones. And, uh, and I think that um, your album fits into that, uh, fits into that realm. It's, um, you know, whether or not, whether or not you, you, you take things to take your brain to another place, like it's music to listen to with headphones and relax. Bur put on some incense and maybe cook a meal. I don't know, but it's... <laughs> But it, but it's it's a good record. I sent it to my um, my fifteen year old son, who, who by the way my my rap taste is nothing like his. Um, he he hates he hates the shit that I love, and it's cool. He's still my son. I love him. Um, <laughs> but but your record was one that we could agree on was a good record. I appreciate that. So, so uh, bringing, bringing families together. Um, were there any incidences, um, anything specific to your life that influenced you to become um, an artist? Were, I mean, were, were there any things like, I could go this, I could be an accountant, or, you know what, I'm just going to do this? So, uh, there's actually a lot of, all right, so, so pretty much, um, I always wanted to do sports, but my mom never let me do it because she was like, you're going to get injured, da, 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 da. you're going to be living out of a tube type stuff. Like just Which is it. weird because it was so, Great. No, I'm just like, I don't, anyways. So pretty much, um, I ended up doing music. Like I got, I was singing in second grade. I went to Wonder Park Elementary and then I, I sang for, I sang with uh, this other girl. And we did, um, We Are the World. No, 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 darn it. It's a Louis Armstrong song. Why am I blinking right now? It's, it's awful. Wonderful Life. Anyways, we sing it. Is it It's no. a Wonderful Life? What a wonderful world. Yeah, it's. Yep, it was that. It was... You have to do the voice? No. I was like, I tried to, like, when I was in third grade, it was awful because, like, no kind, no sign of puberty. Puberty was like far out the other window. So like it was just like it was it was probably very cute, but it was it's probably the most embarrassing thing I've ever did. But so I did that, and then after that, I got a um, a scholarship fully paid off from uh, to go to Alaska Children's Choir, where I was trained in opera singing by Janet Stotts, uh, and I was in there for. 
I think a year, a year and a half. And then after that, uh, like that, I, I performed in the mass, I performed in churches. Like, so I was actually like classically trained in opera um, before all this. And so like, that's kind of like when I started like delving deeper into like music. Cause I was like, ah, oh, I want to start like recording my own stuff. So then I met uh, Vincent Zakai and uh, who were my best friends in middle school and they used to break dance and all this other stuff and like I was just this big big old kid like I couldn't break dance for anything I could hit a nice belly spin but that was it <laughs> and you know so I started producing beats for them I got this app on my phone called Beatmaker 2 and so I was just like all right cool I'm gonna start making some like whatever I'm just playing around and I used to make beats for them to like break dance and stuff too. And then after that, I was like, all right, well, what if I start recording? So I had the, you know, the stock Apple headphones with the mic right here. I started recording with that. I got a couple songs like <laughs> from that era on uh, Spotify under my old name. It's, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to need that much. link. I'm going to need that link, man. You're gonna have to arm wrestle me for that. I don't give that out to anybody. <laughs> oh, shit. I'll be in Anchorage soon and we can do this. We can we can do this. We can find a, a cool restaurant. We can we can have my like my very cool bride hand the hold the camera and we can do this. And like, and if I win, and if I win, we've got to get that mm -hmm. link uh to post up on uh, on on the on the Instagram. Oh. It's gonna be great. <laughs> This is, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, and if I do it, if I do this, right, if I beat you, not only will you share that link, I will share uh, my rap demo from 2003. Please, all right, bet. So like, is that the trade-off? So if I beat you, I get to listen, you, you're dropping your 2003 rap demo. If, if I win, like, I'm telling you, I'm doubling down. I You have Z, you have, jack shit to lose if you lose right if you lose if you if you lose it's you know like it's whatever the link's already out there the spotify is up there's i mean there's a ton of music on spotify and it would be hard to go through x and x and x and x and x and let me let me find this kid i will, I will say the name is pretty specific so when you put it in it's the only thing there so okay all right but, oh, and i'm I'll drop my demo on Distro Kid and we'll put it up on Spotify and and it'll be fun, fun for everyone. Good. Okay, cool. Down, definitely down for that. You just gotta hit me up when you're in town so we can set that up. I will get all the cameras around. I'll even call Voss to do all the lights so it's this dramatic event. <laughs> oh snap! You know what? We could reach out to 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 John. Shout out to John from Forty Night Supply. We might be able to do it in the warehouse. We might. We might be able to get like a small crowd to like to like chant and maybe you know what we, I, I I have chickens I have a small little like chicken and duck farm we could get somebody to hold the chick like hold the chicken like it was like some crazy like back alley like shit from like Ninja Turtles like they're gonna go to battle and war and why does this dude have a chicken there's just a chicken there just some cat with a chicken yeah that'd be epic literally. You give me a time, date, I'll try and get it as figured out as possible. Listen, listen, I got I got some of the beefiest little, little arms, bro. I don't know if you can see. But <laughs> cannons, like, taking me to the gun show. I I don't think those <laughs> cannons are illegal are, are legal in this state, sir. I don't think you should be showing those on video. Federal crime we <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Man. So wait, you said rap demos. So like, hmm. Can you just send it to me? Like please? I just really want to hear it. <laughs> like, like please, like before it's like released, can I get like a you know VIP exclusive listen? Cause I'm like treat it like a snippet tape. Oh snap. Treat it like I a snippet tape. I could treat it like an old 90s uh, like snippet tape. So long before you were conceived, um, rap promo tapes 
um, like they, they would have, they would come out um, as a little, like a little snippet tape. And it was like eight minutes on each side. And it would be like a DJ hosting it. He'd scratch up a couple of records and then maybe he'd move into the next song. Da, 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 da. Uh, Big Pun, his first record, Capital Punishment, had um, like had freestyle exclusives. Like um, mm-hmm. like shit you weren't going to find anywhere. Like him over like, uh, um, like Roots Beats and stuff like that. Just butchering raps. Like going on eight minute freestyles. But... They, they were like, some of them were, were, were super duper dope. We had some that were hosted by uh, DJs like uh, um, Stretch Armstrong from the Stretch and Bobito show. He hosted one for um, uh, a group called Screwball. They were like the heart, the hardest, scariest group of fellas out of New York City. Just some scary guys. Uh, you know, they had like, and they had, and they had the scary DJ Premier beat. So like on one hand it, at the time, DJ Premier was doing like, remixes for janet jackson and then he was also doing beats for guys who like were, would have like robbed janet's security on the way back from the subway like just, just some scary fellers um oh were they rapping over like memphis kind of type beats you know like no 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 this here? is dj premier east coast is like as hard at like gangstar J. Rue the Damager, hardcore East Coast underground beat. So like, so Janet Jackson, I don't know if you've, uh, I mean, um, you're up on your Jay Dilla, but like he did a lot of work for Janet, a, a lot of production for Janet. Um, but there are also remixes for a lot of that stuff that were done by guys like DJ Premier. Like DJ Premier, who's done some of the hardest East Coast production ever, uh, has a Janet Jackson beat. Like um, um. I will say, like most of most of the DJ Premier songs that I've like, like from the top of my brain that I can think of, I don't think I've heard like a hard, hard one from him. Everything I hear is like very like super like, I would say lo-fi in a sense, but like obviously just I would say uh, more like uh, and there's like some weird genre it's called now. It was on like genre Reddit, and they just made some new genre for this specific kind um but it's kind of like it's not vaporwave obviously but it's just like such a soft like no i'm gonna stop no no it's yeah. okay when you say like a soft dj premiere song like what do you mean by that because um like i would say like kind of re- reminiscent of like whenever um so there was this remix of you rock my world that he did and that's like one of the songs that like always plays in my head whenever like I hear any like whenever I think of like DJ Premier. So like that's kind of what I mean by like soft, where it's like this like midnight feeling. Like uh, it's a beat that he used that he uh, that he actually made for Jay Z. I forgot what the name of the original song was, but literally like he flipped the "You Rock My World" with that beat and was like scratching and going crazy. Like man. So I'm gonna send you a playlist of like the songs that I'm like that I can't name, so like it gives context to the conversation. Perfect. And and I will provide to you another playlist that is like DJ Premier's music to rob people by. Like, are you familiar with uh Griselda? Benny the Butcher. Oh, yeah. yeah, so they've got DJ Premier music. They've got music, oh, they've got a lot of music, they've got a few joints with Primo now. Um, but it's and it's, it's all the scariest, hardest shit. And it's always been the scariest, yeah. hardest shit. So when you say like the Rock My World remix is how you know DJ Premier, or maybe it's the Christina Aguilera joint. Um, uh, you know, like, it's like, yeah, he has that. He's got that. But he's got like, he's got soundtracks for terrible things that happen to good people. Um, and that is a large part of his discography. Uh, I mean, he was in a group called Gang Star for you know many years. Um, so yeah, it's it's weird that that's how you know him. Like, but I know him as something completely different. Well, I mean, I also okay. So the only reason that I like, only reason that I kind of like delve deeper into like the more you know like hip hop, uh, cocaine crap or cocaine rap, more of like the Freddie Gibson area of rap music, you know, yeah, is because like. Because um, my brother, Adrian, like, he listens to more of, like, 
he listens to more of that side. Like he's the person who put me on that, like onto like that pit or, uh, you know, like complex. Like I used to grow up watching it with him, with everybody. And like, so he put me on that. Like I grew up literally listening to like, if you put on Pierce the Veil, like I will scream it at the top of my lungs. Like I'm that weirdo. And like, Wait, I listen to like opera music. Like I listen to like uh, opera music and jazz and classical, you know, like that's me. Like I listen to like music like that. Like, so when like uh, my brother, like when we used to sit, sit down a lot, that's where more like I used to like, or, uh, like do more hip hop or all that other stuff. So like, that's why when ever like, cause okay, I'm gonna bring it back. So that's why like, I'm super confused when like, did, do you know if uh, DJ Premier uh, produced on From a King to a God? Um, because like from the from Conway, from Conway yeah. Machine, yeah, I'm I'm fairly certain he did. I'm I'm fairly certain he did he did production on that. Um, mm -hmm. Without without digging into it, I'm fairly certain he did. Um, which I, I thought was one of the best exercises in absolute, like, in grimy rap as high art, right? Mm -hmm. that, that record, uh, as well as, like, Alfredo from uh, Freddy and the Alchemist, who, by the way, is um, one of my favorite producers in, in rap of all time, just because it's, it's, it's melodic, dark. It's like swimming yeah, through scuba diving he's, through mud right um like with, no, this is, the way he plays a sample is crazy uh, like, absolutely insane he's uh he's been a guy that is consistently fun to listen to and, and evolve uh from the the sampling uh, specifically on on hold you down with uh prodigy and nina sky where it's that ho 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 hold you ooh, 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 down da, da, da. That was that the way that that was chopped up was was fantastic, um, and yeah, it was. Ugh. But over the years, he's consistently evolved and in, in incorporating like psychedelic rock and weird experimental jazz from Bulgaria or something like. You know, the Alchemist is just has has been a dude that has just evolved. Um, consistently and almost freakishly over the years but he's a, he's a fun dude to listen to uh, I, I like hearing that your influences come from so many different places it looks like we lost uh mr dion will be missed maybe he'll come back maybe he won't but he will be missed hopefully uh hopefully he didn't just drop out and you know, decided he was done talking about music with me and that's totally cool can't blame him. Bless his heart. All right, folks. Get out. Have a good day. Kick today's ass. Don't let it kick yours. It is almost two o'clock in the afternoon. I got shit to do with my family. And hopefully you have shit to do with people who enjoy your company.